Do we have the slides? Okay, so the title of my talk today, we're gonna to get away from a little bit of the medicine and the, the frustrations with the current healthcare system, which I get, okay? And we're gonna talk about if you could go back in time, you know, if I could go back in time, what would I tell my 35-year-old Mary Claire, all right? So in case you don't know who I am, hi. My name is Mary Claire Haver, and I'm a board-certified uh, obstetrician-gynecologist. I'm also certified by the Menopause Society, and I'm also a wife and a mom and a friend and a community dweller, and so happy and proud to be up here with all of you. Since 2020, I have decided to do something pretty damn radical for an ob -GYN, is walk away from the hospital and the babies and the pap smears and a career that I had based my social currency on, my, my value as a human being, and do something crazy and just focus on the needs of the menopausal woman only. I took some girlfriends out to dinner. Um, Pamela was one of them. Heidi, were you there that night? Or I think you were out. But, and we, and I said, do you think this clinic would work? Do you think I could open a clinic and the way the clinic model would run, I'd have an hour with a patient. I'd have to charge out of pocket because insurance will not reimburse for menopause care. Not really, not the way that I wanted to do it. And, and they said, absolutely, absolutely. So on a wing and a prayer, I opened a menopause clinic and we have a waiting list of, oh, uh, Jen, two years maybe. Two years. Yeah. So we're now hiring, you know, Joan back there is working with me. She's so fantastic. And so we're trying to expand our, you know, coverage um, in the Houston area. But it has been the most beautiful and phenomenal thing I've ever done in medicine. And I have zero regrets. I love the babies. I love seeing them, I, you know, in the community that I birth, you know, right. And I remember being at... Um, our kids' Christmas pageant, right? And so there's the, I, it was baby Jesus and one of the donkeys and the wise men and like six or seven of the, of the kindergartners were kids that I had delivered, you know, and I was just counting them up there. And it's just such an amazing thing to be a part of. But like, why does our value in medicine stop after reproduction? You know, we have no currency left once we're done having babies. And we're, we're gonna get some more into that. So, all right. Oh, clicky. Sorry, guys. So here's me at 35-ish, okay? She's cute, right? <laughs> that is my precious brother, Bob. So those of you who read the Galveston Diet uh, read my story of um, I am uh, a survivor of three of my brother's deaths. So my oldest brother died when I was nine years old from leukemia childhood leukemia, and he beat it for a really long time, and then he came out of remission, and we lost him. And then Bob died in 2015 from end-stage HIV and hepatitis and liver failure. And then my brother Jude died from stage four esophageal cancer uh, in 2020, and then we lost my dad nine months later in 2021. So with all of that, I stand here very motivated to us to live our best lives, to have our healthiest lives because I may not get that opportunity. And what I've learned, I wanna share with all of you. Um, hang on one second. So for years, I took menopause for granted, okay? This is me at 35, living my best life, raising my babies, having fun with my brothers, you know, um, my, my girlfriends. I was healthy, I was healthy, but I really kind of thought I was healthy because I was thin, you know? And thin meant healthy. And I would just have this easy breezy menopause. You know, I wouldn't even, it wasn't even on the radar. I hated menopause. I didn't want to talk about it. I didn't want to treat people with it. I just thought they were whiny. And you know, I just, uh, what can I do to help them? Because I graduated from my residency program in 2002. And guess what else happened in 2002? WHI. We are the last generation of OB-GYNs who were ever trained in HRT at all, and then the rug got pulled out from one of us, you know, our last year, right as we graduated. And so, and it was horrible and terrible, and you know, we didn't have a professor to sit down and walk us through the, what actually happened in the WHI, and that estrogen actually doesn't cause breast cancer. Um, okay, well, you know, menopause came, and reality definitely had other plans. Here I am trying to look pensive in my dining room. Um, <laughs> The light, my hair, 
So, um, so what would I tell you, Mary Claire, at 35? Uh, enjoy this. Enjoy your friends. Enjoy your family. Enjoy your children. Enjoy your job. Enjoy your brothers, you know. And because that's all going to change for you in ways that you would never, ever, ever expect it. Um, so in my reality, when my brother got really, really sick, I, um, at the exact same time, I happened to decide, okay, I'm going to get off of HRT. I mean, sorry, birth control. I was on birth control to treat PCOS. And I'm going to come off of that and then see where I'm at. I was like 48 ish and I'll, you know, get some blood work and figure that out. And then I rushed home to do Bob's end of life care and, um, he didn't make it. And so went through his well, his end of life, and then went through a pretty bad depression, you know, had to go right back to work because bereavement leave was a week, and I did that at his bedside, and then the funeral. And um, and then I remember, like, driving home from the office, and I would cry and cry and cry, and then I would hold it together to go back into the house, and then I would go into the pantry, and I would grab my kids' goldfish crackers. We bought them in those giant ones, you know, the extra cheddar, yeah. those. <laughs> And I would just sit there and stuff them into my face as just a way to fill the hole, you know, that I had from, from my grief. And I was also not sleeping, and I was gaining weight, and, you know, there were all reasons for that, and I was definitely grieving. But then after a few months, when the grief fog started to lift, I realized, <laughs> wait, when was my last period, you know? Because of PCOS, I never had a regular period. I'd often go months without cycles. And I was like, wait, wait, I'm not sleeping. I mean, I feel better. Like, I'm, I'm getting past the grief process. But I was gaslighting myself. I'm like, this is my job. I'm an OB-GYN, and I can't recognize my own menopause. And so we got the blood work, and my FSH was like 100. And, you know, I was, I was definitely menopausal. I had horrible joint pain. I was not sleeping. I was, you know, I had very classic symptoms of menopause. Um, I really... It really hit me hard. I thought of menopause as being old. I thought I was an old lady now. I didn't, I, did, I was like, this is it. This is the end for me. You know, and I was really reluctant to consider HRT for myself at the time because I felt like a failure. I was giving in and I was scared of the, all the complications that I understood. I had not educated myself to what, and I didn't realize there was so much new education out there. Why? And I'm going to call them out publicly because the American Board of OBGYN makes us read all these articles every year. Great articles, beautiful research, almost nothing about menopause. I mean, maybe one article a year. When you look at how the American Board articles for our recertification are stratified, there's no menopause category. Okay, there's oncology, gynecology, reproductive, you know, like, like ethics, all these important, important things. But there is a gaping hole where there's no, no information on menopause. The year that the American Heart Association published in Circulation Magazine in 2020, the groundbreaking article about how, how safe estrogen is and how it's actually protective for heart disease in the right population, I, I like jumped off the treadmill. I was so excited. I couldn't believe that they actually had a meaningful article about menopause care that they had produced. And that's like the one in the last four years. So, but I digress, okay. Um, so, you know, I started my hormone therapy and immediately the world got better. The noise quieted. You know, I, I think about the, the patients who are going on the GLP-1 agonist or starting, you know, metformin and that, that food noise is gone right? As for so many patients are trying it. And, you know, my, my menopause noise was gone. I didn't realize that there was this like shh in the background. It was just disrupting so many parts of my life. And all of that quieted down. It just, my life was so much better. Um, and in this journey, you guys know that I, I, most of the pain points of the patients coming in my clinic at the time that, that I could recognize were weight gain, almost a universal weight gain that they could not explain. Now, what we were taught is that you gain weight because you eat too much and you don't move enough. 
And these are my friends, my, you know, women I've known their whole reproductive lives who I know I work out with them. I go to the grocery store with them. I live in a small community that they're doing the things and they're having absolute unexplained weight gain. And I'm like, something, they, and it happened to me. <laughs> and I was like, something's not right. So that led me to all of the research I did for Galveston Diet and then that book and, you know, all the wonderful things. Um, every woman's journey is as individual as you are. And there's no cookie cutter, you know, one size fits all approach to hormone therapy. And that we have to think of menopause as a toolkit, as you probably heard me say on social media, that HRT is, is wonderful and can go a really long way, but if you're not also making sure you're maximizing your sleep and your stress reduction and putting up boundaries and you know finding a community of support and demanding what we need as a population and not letting ourselves be gaslit or, or put on the wayside. Like Dr. Min said last night, this is not gonna start in the doctor's office, this cataclysmic change that we need. It's gonna start with y'all talking about it normalizing it, talking to your daughters, your friends, your loved ones, and God bless the men who have been here. Oh my God, my husband's not even here, you know? <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> so Mary Claire, 35-year-old cute Mary Claire, what would I, what would I tell you? Um, so those are my babies, when they were babies. Um, enjoy these years. Your babies, your marriage, your family, your friends, your health, your eyebrows, your <laughs> waistline, and your ability to handle the changes that life throws at you. I had it going. I was like killing it at 35. Your babies will grow and leave you. Two of your brothers and your father will die. Your friends will divorce. A hurricane will come and wipe out your community. Um, you will change your job twice. Uh, you will leave the country for two years for your husband's job, and your marriage will get worse, but then better. Um, as you struggle with everything in your life that you're trying to balance, like every single one of you are, don't forget to prioritize yourself, your mental health. You must put your oxygen mask on first before you can take care of everything else in your world. Um, menopause is going to come, Mary Claire, and it is going to challenge you in ways that you never imagined. But you need to prepare for this. So here's what you got to do. Number one, I'm going to ask you to do something very radical, Mary Claire. I want you to let go of being thin as a measure of health and stop talking to your patients about that. Um, I want you, you might not believe this, in about 20 years, the American Medical Association is going to stop using weight and BMI as a measure of chronic disease risk. You know, this is a big ship to course correct. Um, and in order to do so, Mary Claire, you're going to need a lot of internal internalization and thinking and maybe some therapy, okay? Um, I know you've been fixated on this elusive goal of being thin, equating it with your beauty and self-worth, but I know societal norms and your medical training have ingrained this level of thinking into your being, but Mary Claire, this pursuit of thinness you know, di um, disguised as health is going to take tremendous toll on your mental health. You're going to pass that on to your patients. Constant caloric restriction and cardio combined with aging is going to chip away at your muscle mass and your bone strength, both of which, because of your genetics, you desperately need to stay healthy as you age. Um, so, Mary Claire, you need proof? Okay. You know I like receipts. All right. So here's a graph showing skeletal muscle mass. Dr. Wright is loving this right now. Okay. <laughs> And age, okay? And so our genetic, our environmental, our socioeconomic factors, you know, the more muscle mass, our muscle mass peaks in midlife, you know, before midlife. And then we have this, we have this decline, okay? The decline is not as steady as this curve looks. What happens is we have our genetic kind of peak, and then if you were working out and doing the training and eating the protein, you have this, this high level. We decline because of genetics, aging, and menopause. But then we have an injury. And then we have an illness. 
and we get these massive drops in our muscle mass. And they're very difficult to bring back up, especially if you're not doing the lifting and eating the protein. And so, you know, I hate unhealthy lifestyle. This is the only slide I could find. Um, and then when we cross, there's that theoretical disability disorder and health threshold. That's when we fall and break at 70. That's when we get the hip fractures and the, the, the horrible lives. At Who has, you know, I, my best friend's father fell and broke his hip. You know, he's not menopausal. But, like, watching a human being go through that, this is avoidable. We don't, this doesn't have to happen. We're going to fall at 70. We're going to fall at 80. It's inevitable. But we don't have to break. And it's within our power right now to make those changes so that this doesn't happen to us. Okay. So here's the data. You know, about 7 to 8% per decade. This is muscle mass loss. And then it starts accelerating as we age, but we get these massive drops with the inevitable illness and injury. And so shoring yourself up when you're healthy is key. And focusing on just being skinny is not going to get us there, OK? Um, also, our ability to fight off insulin resistance. Your muscle mass is key for that as well. I am an insulin resistant human being. I've had my home IR score checked. It's another level, another blood test you can talk about. Um, and it was 3.4 several months ago. I've got it back under control. I don't have muscle mass, you know, like, like I don't have a lot of that. So genetically. Um, okay. And here's the scariest statistic of all. If a woman falls and breaks her hip after the age of 65, the risk of death, death, in one year, if not surgically repaired, is 29%. But if she chooses not to have surgery, because we're again, risk, benefits, options, your body, your choice, it's almost 80%. Hello? <laughs> <laughs> Number two, nutrition over calories. OK? So Mary Claire, I'm going to ask you to start focusing on the quality of what you eat, not just counting calories. Um, I realize you think good nutrition is like the Supreme Court's definition of pornography. You know it when you see it, right? Like, that's, that's healthy. It's good. Um, but I want you to read as much as possible about food and the foods that fight inflammation and the common nutritional deficiencies for women in middle age, like fiber and magnesium, right? Um, you may even want to enroll in the culinary medicine program at Tulane University. Mary Claire it might teach you a few things, um, which I did, and I got certified. So, um, But here's what you need to realize. Protein is more important than you realize. So the FDA, not a friend of women, right, <laughs> on many levels, is recommending 0.8 grams per kilogram. So math, I know. Um, however, there was some great information. It's still coming out from the WHI data set, OK? And here's one of the facts. The women who had 1.2 grams per kilogram of protein in their daily intake had a lower risk of frailty and better physical function than the women who had the 0.8. If they had 1.6, they had the highest muscle mass and strength. And you know what muscle mass and strength gets us? We don't fall and break, and we don't get diabetes as often, OK? Um, and this was, this was actually a study done in postmenopausal women looking at the Mediterranean diet, very similar to Galveston diet, for some reason. Um, so, and they basically broke it down as to why something like the Mediterranean diet would be helpful for menopausal women. And so di dietary antioxidants, your beta carotenes, your vitamins, your CE, selenium, and polyphenols, they're not talking about supplements. This is food, okay? You should get your nutrition from food. We supplement the gaps. You cannot negate a poor dietary choice with a handful of supplements, okay? Coming from a doctor who sells supplements. Please buy my supplements. Um, <laughs> OK, so by loading up on the things that fight inflammation naturally, we have lower oxidative. They measured all these things, OK? They lowered their oxidative stress and inflammation. They did things to bones that were good. You know, all of the inflammatory markers went down. I, these, the doctors in here are like, yay. Um, beta carotene, so great for bone. 
And then magnesium. Y'all know I love my mag. I don't sell that one, so, you know. Um, increasing muscle performance. Yeah, we're working on it. <laughs> um, energy mentality. I mean, all of this. But this is food talking, right? When in your life did you think about these things when you thought about being healthy? You thought about being thin. We have to stop that. Stop teaching our daughters that. And as physicians, we have to stop this mantra in the office. We're hurting people. Okay. Simply by the fact... Oh, did I back up? Let me see. I'm missing a slide. Okay. Uh, maybe it got in the next one. Okay. Well, I'll just read it to you. Um, Postmenopausal women have a two to three higher chance of having metabolic syndrome compared to other similarly, similarly aged premenopausal women. Just being menopausal, when your ovaries shut down, puts you at risk for metabolic syndrome. If, you're, if you had a twin sister and she had surgical menopause, your risk is three times higher than her of having metabolic syndrome. Number three, Mary Claire, well, my slides are wonky. Okay, educate yourself about menopause because the people who were in charge of educating me aren't doing a good job, aren't doing a job. Now is the time to educate yourself at 35. Um, you are failing the women you are trying to take care of right now by relying on the limited training you received in medical school and residency. You mean well and you work your ass off, but... The system is built to fail the menopausal women. Um, and so you're going to have to push yourself beyond the system if you really want to make a difference to these women. The menopause society is one place to start. Only 20% of OBGYN residencies offer any training in menopause, like specific. Here's a clinic. Let's go see these patients and talk about menopause. Um, I had maybe an hour of lecture in medical school total. And um, Kate and Sharon, I think we talked maybe six hours, you know, with Dr. Nagamani and Dr. May Ellen Kelver sitting around a table. That was it. So I'm going to tell you a story. And I don't know if y'all remember this one, but um, one of my upper level residents, uh, when we had gyne clinics, so they would, all the charts would come in and we'd probably see 80 women in a day. And there's just stacks of charts back when we had paper. You know, y'all are my age, so you know what paper is. Um, <laughs> And so the upper levels would grab the charts first, and they'd run to go see all the surgical patients, and they would leave whatever else was left, the drip and itch stuff, and the, you know, and then they said, oh, y'all get the WWs, the whiny women. And if she was Caucasian, it was a WWW. <laughs> and they, these, these guys were from South Texas, and they had boots on, and, you know, you got the WWs. Okay, and I'll never forget that. And so I've asked other OBGYNs across the country, and they were like, yeah, whiny guiny. Like, they all had their own little nicknames for, for these things. So that's us. That's me right now, you know. And that wasn't written in a chart. I never heard a professor say that. But that is how the OBGYN residency training programs in the early 2000s considered taking care of a menopausal woman. One, they didn't have the tools. They didn't know what they did think they were whiny because uh, I'm here to do surgery and catch a few babies. You know, like shepherding you through the last 30 of your life is really not a priority in the OBGYN training, training programs, and that has got to stop. Okay. So let's do a quick experiment. Who's got Wi-Fi? Okay. All right. So this half of the room, quickly, take out your phones, pull up PubMed.org. PubMed.org. Everybody, you know, if you got it, do it. So this half of the room, I want you to look up the word pregnancy. That's it. And this half of the room, I want you to type in the word menopause. PubMed. So PubMed is P-U-B-M-E-D. PubMed is like where we go to pull research articles. It's a national repository of like real medical articles. Just search the word pregnancy and then menopause. Okay. Oh, dot gov, dot gov, PubMed, dot gov. Um, so how many articles for pregnancy do you see? 1.1 million, right? Okay, now this is everything in the history of what's been published, right? How many menopause articles do we have? 96,000. I think it's 96, yeah. So 10 to 1 of the research dollars, of the research brains, of what is available to us as women. Are we 
Do we deserve 10% to be focused on us? You know, reproduction is important. You know, I love, I love my children, and if you choose to have them, you know. But it, it, suddenly I'm 90% less valuable as a human being in the last third of my life. That's what's happening today. You can do this same search in the last three years, and that 10 to 1 holds. That has got to change, and you have to demand it. You need to vote for your health. You need to talk, you know, push these physicians because you're, we're, I, I hate to do this, but you're going to have to educate your providers. And we're going to have to fight to change the system. I, you know, I'm just one voice. I'm a very loud voice, I know. But this is a group effort, and it starts here and it starts now. Okay. Um, consider Mary Claire aging a privilege. It's going to be denied to three of your brothers. You're going to stand on the stage at 55 thinking about how in about a year and a half you will outlive three of your brothers and have lives that they were denied. Um, so it's time to change the prevailing social narrative around menopause. We are amazing. I've got a lot of life left to live. I've never been more successful in my entire life. I've never been more fulfilled in my relationships, in my friendships, in my children, in the life that I've built. And I want more. I deserve more. We can do this, you know. But if we're hamstringed by menopause, it, we're not going to live our best lives. Um, okay. Sorry, getting a little emotional. Uh, okay. And last but not least, Mary Claire, stop looking for a magic pill and a quick fix. Remember that patterns of behavior are what are going to impact our health the most. And if you're cold, you can use your uh, towels from your uh, swag bags. <laughs> um, just like when you open a toolkit, you'll find an array of items there available for your health. Um, it's important to recognize that while medical and school and residency have not prepared you for treating menopause, um, and not, not prepared you for the last third of your life, really, that you've got to prioritize your nutrition, your movement, your stress reduction, your boundaries, your sleep. All of that is going to work together with your hormone therapy if you're a candidate, okay? It's all important. And if you're not a candidate or you choose not to do it, your body, your choice, I stand behind you. We have other options, guys. We have to treat it symptom by symptom, but we can help, okay? So, Mary Claire, I leave you with this. Menopause is inevitable, but suffering through it is not. Okay. <laughs> I made the mess up here. So, questions? I have a couple of, two minutes. Okay. Oh, wait. Do I need a doctor to prescribe HRT or do yeah, I can go on this alloy? Yeah, prescription <laughs> is required. Okay. So you need a healthcare provider who is licensed to practice medicine and licensed to prescribe in order to get hormone therapy. It is a prescription. Now, you can, if you are lucky enough to find a face-to-face -face human being, that's great. If not, we have great telemedicine options. These companies were built because they saw this huge gap. And we have two of the best with us on this trip. And so you, we've heard a lot about Ally today, fabulous. And we also have Evernow. There'll be the Thursdays their day. So, you know, okay. like these are fabulous options. So, so MIDI is also I, another really good one. If I need that hormone therapy, is there any kind of doctor that you could call and invite them to try Yeah, I'll, I'll let them, yeah. Oh, okay. I just wanted to let her know that it's free. Ally did have that. Yeah. So they will set you up, these, these companies will set you up with providers who will go through your history, like do all the things, but they are built for menopause. Even if I still have a period? Girl, I got you. <laughs> a period should not define menopause. This has got to stop. The absence or presence of a period should not define menopause. It's a clue. That's all it is. Okay, I got one over here. A little here. feisty. Dr. Haver. Um, just thank it's you so much. Life. This is the third time I've seen you present that speech, and I cry every time. Aww. It's fascinating. She's fascinating. Um, I was, I'm fortunate enough to be one of your patients. 
I'm fortunate enough to be one of your patients. I was uh, 61, 60 years old at the time, so desperate that I got on the plane from Pennsylvania and I got to Texas and I am blessed. What my question is now is that 61, I feel such a sense of responsibility to make sure that younger generation know what I know and um, to not have to go through what I did between 40 and 60. I call it the IST era, the orthotist, the endocrinologist, the dermatologist. Um, I don't want them to go through that era. So as an example, what, you know, you have young girls and I have a young stepdaughter that, you know, I talk to her about this, but there's resistance being that menopause is, I'm not an old lady. Um, um, well, in my do? house, my kids didn't have a choice. So. <laughs> I figured as much. Um, and my oldest is in medical school. A lot of y'all know that. And so she's a first-year med student. And she has told me she is radicalized, you know, for, and she's teaching her professors. And I'm like, you probably want to just keep that down a little bit until you <laughs> establish yourself, you know, and um, just be humble. And, you know, she's, um, but we need to normalize this. And my, my charge to all of you, share your stories. Talk about this. You know, we, it's not, we can't optimize until we normalize. We need to bring everyone up and realize that there are options for you. This is a thing. It is going to change your life, even if you don't have the classic symptoms. I mean, part of me is so grateful that I did because I don't know if I'd be up here today if I had a breeze through it and not had the obvious symptoms. I don't know if I would have become an evangelical. You know, and so I don't know. This is the path that God put me on, and thank God. And so my symptoms led me here today. But like Marnie, who's my book editor, okay, from Penguin Random House, hello, um, suffered through two books with me now. And um, so she's fabulous. And, you know, she didn't have a lot of symptoms. And there are some tremendous, you have to think of it as part of your longevity plan. You do it, you don't do it, that's up to you. Not every woman will choose it or is a candidate, but for God's sake, we all deserve the conversation with someone who's educated. And that's where the work is. Okay. Um, so I'm a big fan of the telehealth um, approach in, in trying to speak with other women, trying to find someone, you know, to be able to talk to regarding their symptoms and everything. Is the is Are the companies that are represented here, are they... Are you able to put like your insurance through there, or is it still out of pocket? Or I'll, I'll let them speak to the exact financial uh, stuff. Since um, that route, I don't want to say it wrong because they're all kind yeah, of a little bit different. Um, with the women's so. health clinics and things, it's so expensive. So trying to help women find a, le a less expensive route and maybe insurance covering part of it would be a big question for you. Right. Um, So um, I'll let them, do y'all want to come up and, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Alicia, do you want to say? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hold the box. <laughs> yeah, there you go, guys. Amazing. Uh, Alicia Jackson, um, founder or CEO of EverNow. We're one of the other telehealth companies out there. Um, so our memberships today are cash pay, so $29 a month, because we believe it's a journey. So we want to be with you. You get a dedicated provider. And then all of our medications are covered by insurance. So we can send them to whatever pharmacy you want, and you can just pay with your insurance there. Hi. Um, so we're entirely cash pay. We keep our, we checked in with Walgreens, and we are, um, our prices for um, estradiol are the exact same as the Walgreens national average for copays. And this is partly because my co-founder, who I call our canary in the coal mine, she went through surgical menopause at 40 and tried absolutely everything, including pellets, including um, homeopathy, including so many different things. But she was at one point paying like $500 a month to get her blood tested and the pellets and the things. So we really wanted to make it accessible to everyone. That said, we will be working on insurance options, but for the moment, we will print you a receipt and you will be able to, and we'll tailor it to whatever your insurance company needs, and we give the, that to you as a PDF. Um, but for the most part, our real, our real goal is to democratize and increase access to hormonal solutions. Okay. Thank you. I didn't want to mess it up, you know. Okay, we're done. All right, guys. <laughs>